Thank you so much. Thank you, John. Welcome everyone to day two of the BISA annual conference and to today's keynote roundtable. My name is Jenna Marshall. I'm a postdoc at the University of Kassel. And I, along with my colleague, Dr. Heba Youssef from the University of Brighton, would like to extend a warm welcome to you all who are joining us this afternoon for a continuation of keynote roundtables in the digital space. Today's keynote roundtables feature the conference provocation of forgetting international studies, and it offers an opportunity to both critically engage with this period of global change and to reflect upon the possibilities and limitations of the discipline in confronting it. So we have a fantastic cadre of speakers from across the globe to offer their interventions on this theme. And to start this conversation, I'm delighted to welcome today's speakers, Dr. Lata Naraswamy. Uh, Dr. Naraswamy is um, an associate professor uh, in politics of global development at the University of Leeds. Um, also Professor Sabelo, and Ndovu Gesheni, Chair of Epistemologies of the Global South, with an emphasis on Africa at the University of Bayreuth in Germany. Dr. Sitem Bele Mbete of the, um, of the University of Pretoria. She, um, she is a lecturer in international relations and South African politics in the Department of Political Science and a 2019 Open Society Foundation Democracy Fellow, and Dr. Swati Parashar of the University of Gothenburg, who is an Associate Professor at the School of Global Studies in Sweden. So each speaker will deliver 15 minute interventions, after which we will open up to discussions firstly amongst the panelists and then to the wider audience. So to begin, Lata. Great, thank you, uh, Jenna and Heba, and thank you to the to Julia Welland and to the BISA committee for the invitation to speak. It's such a privilege and honor, and I am a disciplinary interloper in this year's conference. And it's such a pleasure to share this virtual stage with such esteemed colleagues. Now, by disciplinary interloper, I'm usually somebody that associates myself broadly with international development. And within that, I have always been very interested in how we know the world, the way we conceptualize knowledge. So who gets to decide what we know and how we know it? So conceptualizing the world, what counts as knowledge, how that knowledge is valued, validated. And I have been interested for many years in the intersectional and colonial dynamics of knowledge as it pertains broadly to the study of what we call development. So within this then, I'm interested in the power of language, the actual words we use, how they are used, interpreted, and what, if any, might be the discursive and material consequences of these interpretations for development theory and practice. So what a privilege to start our keynote roundtable today. And we have been invited to reflect on the theme, forget international studies, question mark. So before I decide whether to forget it or not, I'd like to start by reflecting on, well, what is international studies? And then what might lead us to decide to forget it? So in order to answer this question and drawing on my own work around the politics of knowledge, I would like to share with you some reflections on quote unquote, the international, namely, what and where is international studies? How do ideas become international and whose knowledge counts as international? So first, what and where is international studies? So let's start with the studies bit. So here I'd like to draw very briefly on an article written by Caroline Kennedy Pipe and Nicholas Renger in 2006 to celebrate BISA's 30th anniversary. And I thought this was an appropriate place to start because we are at a BISA conference. And with the establishment of um, BISA in 1975, a decision early on was made according to these authors to call it international studies very deliberately rather than international politics or international relations. Since as Susan Strange, who was one of the key architects of the early visions for BISA said, and I quote, those interested in the international did and should include historians, economists, lawyers, and many others, not just those interested in politics. And this is absolutely right. International studies 
uh, is multi or indeed interdisciplinary. And I think that is reflected in this year's conference program very well indeed. So this is a real, this is a really important thing to celebrate. They also acknowledge in this article that in the mid 1970s, international studies was, and I quote, Anglo-American in both its focus and the backgrounds of those engaged in studying world politics. This acknowledgement is important, and they go on to document the ways in which the discipline itself has expanded, which again is to its credit, taking in a much wider range of ideas under the umbrella of the quote unquote international. Now, as Sabella will eloquently highlight um, after uh, in, our, in our round table, the field itself, despite the efforts in many different ways to widen and diversify the field, as captured by Kennedy, Pipe and Renger, is still nonetheless predicated on a colonial legacy, what Sabello, I think you're going to be calling the imperial episteme, which he'll talk about more in, in his intervention. But in order to sort of set out a frame for our discussions today and to map this terrain, what I'd like to be able to bring to this discussion is to look at this in concrete terms. What does this concretely mean for the quote unquote international in international studies? So the first thing here is that labels such as area studies, development as distinguishable from international relations tells us something about the dynamics of the international, which very often gets interpreted as the West and the rest. Let's look at this in a little more detail. If we look at um, language like international governments, governance, so we might focus on, for instance, the OECD, the G7, the Western security apparatus, the foreign policy of the US, the UK, or the EU. The UN, which is nominally inclusive of everyone, but of course there is the Security Council, which is this much narrower set of nations that again are making decisions about both what security means, how it's interpreted and where it's enforced. Setembele's analysis, again, pointing to, will, will, will point uh, uh, fantastically well to questions around Pan-Africanism. And I think that's something that we can re revisit in the context of this framing of, of notions of governance. But I'd like to just reflect on that point briefly because the designation of the BRICS countries, so Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, is in a way a challenge here. But this grouping together of so-called developing countries China, maybe not so much, but the other ones definitely has an othering effect. These are still African or developing, never international in an epistemic sense. The other category that we might have in the international is international organizations. Now, we've already talked a little bit about the UN, but here I'm thinking about um, INGOs in particular. So who does international work? Now, this is no less true, this question of who is international, um, sort of where international work is done and who this refers to. Um, when we think about international organizations, we'll immediately think of Oxfam, the Red Cross, Amnesty International. But I put to you the Bangladesh Rural Advancement Committee, or BRAC. Founded in 1972 in rural Bangladesh, it is, and I quote from its website, the world's largest development organization with successful programs to tackle poverty fully and effectively, proceeding to be scaled up in other countries. BRAC's programs reach millions of people in, Bangladesh, Afghanistan, Tanzania, Uganda, South Sudan, Sierra Leone, Liberia, Myanmar, Nepal, and the Philippines, unquote. It also has a bank and its own university. And still the economist refers to it as an NGO. And I've seen many projects where BRAC is listed as the so-called local partner, okay? So when we think about who gets to do international work and who are the international organizations, even extremely large organizations like BRAC are not in our imaginary. Okay, so let's move on to the second question. How do ideas become international? Now here I'd like to draw attention to an area of interest that has long been my own passion is actually interrogating language. And here I mean literally the language of our practice, which is English. Okay, so this is meant in the literal sense because we function primarily in English including here today, despite the very international um, profile of the speakers that are going to be featured in these three days of the conference. The soft power of thinking, speaking, and formulating ideas predominantly in English, regardless of the diversity of language spaces we might operate in, serves to narrow how we conceptualize the international. Related to this is the tendency for us to use a professionalized academic jargony kind of English, which just makes this problem worse. And I'm actually doing it as I speak, so I, I get it, I, I, I'm doing it, I know, but it's also key to ideas as being accepted as international. I won't get taken seriously if I don't use the jargon, 
And I, I use that language because I understand that. So that's a way of disciplining my behavior in this space. Norms of communication. So in addition to English, another preoccupation of mine over many years, because I started life before, an, before I was an academic, I was what we might call loosely a knowledge for development practitioner. So I've always been interested in the how we communicate. So the norms of our communication, in addition to English, I've always been concerned about how we communicate, how do we validate knowledge. So yes, again, there is an irony of me saying this at an English language northern subscription only disciplinary conference. It's not lost on me. But it is important for us to reflect on this further, because what counts as international knowledge, and I use that in inverted commas, depends on a validation process that consists of peer review, paywalled elite journals, book publishing, and also if, let's say, we're making something available in the public domain, we have to ensure that it's formatted in a report style, converted to a PDF, and uploaded to a website, and probably launched in an event like this, okay? That's problematic because it creates inclusive and inclusion and exclusion uh, dynamics that we need to be attentive to. Third and final question I have then is whose knowledge counts as international? So here there are a number of dynamics we can draw out that also reflect the discussions that will come up in a number of the of, in, our, in, in, our, in my colleagues' um, talks that are forthcoming, but I think it's worth drawing attention to uh, as well, because I, I think it's really important, so I'd like to be able to emphasize it, which is this coloniality of the international with Sabello you'll be uh, coming back to, and I look forward listening to very much. Decolonizing. That question of decolonizing, why is my curriculum white? A lot of those movements are in fact a response to some of these dynamics and tendencies, which is worth highlighting. So firstly, race dynamics. The risk in our collective scholarship, which cuts across international studies, is centering what Gurminder Bambrad terms methodological whiteness. So put simply, this puts whiteness as the norm, which has the effect of both centering it whilst simultaneously invisibilizing it. So it's there all the time, but actually we can't see it because it's the norm. So we actually don't talk about it because we kind of take it as rote. So what is the consequence for whose knowledge counts as international? So bodies racialized as quote unquote white are allowed to be global experts, whereas anyone viewed as darker skinned is presumed to represent their ethnic and or country of origin and or racialized category. This is not just a race issue. Intersectionality here matters very much. So race, gender, and class all interact in this space. So I can only represent myself or my group, but this is not just an issue if I'm a white man, um, or if this is a, uh, in the sense that I'm, so as a, as a brown woman, I can represent brown women, but you can talk about anybody if you're a white man. But if you're talking about, if you are um, embodied as a, as, a, as, a, as a brown or black woman, then you're there to talk about third world women. But if you're a white woman, then you can talk about all women. This is scholarship that's been there for a long time. Trin T. Minha was talking about this in the 90s. Um, Aziz Johnson has talked about it more recently. So let's think about what this looks like concretely. And we are in a conference space, so it's worth reflecting on. If we think about a conference panel or some sort of global event that might have an international take, Northern academic experts, and I do include myself in that category, and I'll come back to that in a minute, are invited to share global or theoretical perspectives on issues like health or political economy. Whereas people who are labeled as loosely from the global south tend to be incorporated as quote unquote local voices, giving us grassroots perspective, labeled as someone from Nigeria or from India or from Colombia and meant to represent those country perspectives. So my question is, what if we saw people from the global south as global experts who might perhaps have something to say about the climate or gender equality beyond their context? What if they had a comment on the global north? Would we even be willing to listen? Secondly, what knowledge counts as international? Here we can draw out the discursive dominance of international organizations, the designation, designation of which is the preserve of formal imper former imperial powers who created the Bretton Woods institutions, who dominated the UN, INGOs, continuously reproducing and entrenching West and the rest narratives. So concretely, this, is, this discursive dominance in turn governs what we are allowed to talk about. So this is the dominance of the SDGs. I have talked about the SDGs ad nauseum in the last six years. In every funding bid, it cuts across all of my teaching, or this or that UN resolution. I know, Swati, you're going to be talking about women, peace, and security, so no doubt you'll revisit that. Again, that's going to be an important intervention. I look forward to it. But if we, if we think about then 
how that frames the approach, it's telling us both what the problem and then the potential solution is without giving us a chance to actually debate what the problem and the solution might look like. Alongside this, then, we've got a broader question, then, of a universalization of Western frameworks. This is something that we need to reflect on as academic communities, because we are, in, we are incentivized in higher education to become experts, right? We are actually, our, our advancement in this space depends on us being able to say, I know everything or almost everything about this or that issue. Um, it undermines the sorts of more pluriversal approaches that Anna Sabella, you'll be talking about that might move us away from these tendencies uh, to frame in very narrow ways. But here is a caveat that I'd like to offer to challenge how we frame marginality in the international. And I include myself in this, as I said, I would, because I live in a minoritized body, but I am both from and of the West. So I am both Canadian and I'm British. And I hold a privileged position as a permanent academic at a British university. And I have found in my research the tendency for dominant frameworks to be proliferated and ultimately reproduced by transnational elites in a range of contexts. And this raises questions for us about what, whether it's enough if a research idea or issue is framed as if coming from the global south. So privileging views of and engagement with the global south is undoubtedly important given the, given the global imbalance of power in knowledge systems. But talking about diversity in what tends to be tokenistic ways, and we've all seen those, underestimates the explicit and implicit processes that exist to validate and legitimize ideas, and by extension the people that are variously allowed to be included or excluded as a result of those processes. So those people who are allowed to exist as part of the international. So for me, we have to be asking critical questions, not just about the messenger, which is where that tokenistic diversity action tends to sit, but also about the message. And that's why intersectionality is so important. The broader question of the convergence and new hegemonies emerging within and between North and South is a theme that I know Swati will pick up with elegance and gusto shortly. So what does this mean concretely? North-South divides also reproduce colonial logics to limit what it means to engage with the international. So the first example here for me is around development studies, despite addressing itself to or writing about the vast majority of the world's lands and people is not considered international, which is part of the othering that also derives from the coloniality of the international which Sabello will conceptualize for us shortly. I have always been struck, for instance, at how lessons in development studies seem never to have any relevance in so-called developed country contexts, never considered international in that sense. So why, for instance, do we not call the terms and conditions imposed on Greece during its financial crisis and subsequent bailout by the European Central Bank a structural adjustment program? Why is it that when so-called experts are called upon to discuss that crisis, they are not economists or social scientists from global South countries who have decades of experience of structural adjustment programs and their subsequent fallout, because that experience is about development. It is not international. And we are in the middle of a global pandemic. So why, after direct experience of epidemic or pandemic management in West Africa especially, but with a long history of managing disease outbreaks across Africa and Asia, has the West or the North, whatever we're calling ourselves, been unwilling to draw on or learn from the global South? I'll tell you, because international knowledge, i.e. knowledge for the whole world, originates in the global north, and by extension, the implication here is that we, this collective we in the global north, have nothing to learn from anyone else, because we are the international. Okay, so then the challenge then is not simply for me to forget international studies, and indeed we must do the opposite, because otherwise, and again as an interloper from another discipline, it's like having messages from another galaxy. We are in danger of repeating the mistakes of development studies. So when President Truman declared a commitment to the improvement and growth of underdeveloped areas in his inaugural speech as president in 1949, development also became the language of historical erasure, chiding, cajoling, and bullying the underdeveloped to become developed like us, quote unquote, without any reflection on how and why the world came to be divided in this way in the first place. So we mustn't forget international studies, which would mean losing these historical reflections that we're discussing today, but rather to engage in more dynamic processes of what I would call unlearning, 
challenging north-south binaries that divide the world into west and the rest, and building solidarities across borders that value a diversity of both people and knowledges expressed in many languages so that we can collectively reimagine a genuinely international, intersectional internationalism that is fit for a 21st century post-COVID world. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lata. Thank you so much. Um, Sabello. Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you for the invitation and the greetings to all of you. I'm actually privileged to be among these distinguished scholars. And uh, let me take this opportunity to, to, to share with you a few ideas which I have regarding the topic under discussion today. And the thank you Lata for raising the issues of which and the whose knowledge counts. Um, what is the international? Uh, how do ideas become international? Uh, and they're also touching on the issues of decolonizing and the unlearning. My talk will also reflect on some of those things and those issues. <clears throat> uh, I think like Lata, I'm also not from international relations. Um, I'm not even from political science. Uh, I no longer know where I'm from, but uh, I'm not from that discipline. Uh, <clears throat> I generally work outside disciplines. So I have a chair in epistemologies of the global south, which is not located in any discipline at the moment. <clears throat> so if I say some things which are strange, to those who are from the discipline, please pardon me. Uh, I want to come into this question of forgetting uh, international studies in a bit a tangential way, in the sense that uh, <clears throat> I want to first of all, think about internationalism as the subject of international studies. Uh, that are we really studying something which exists or we're studying something which is yet to exist? So my first uh, point, was really that perhaps the best starting point is to think about the international, not as something which exists, but something which is an aspiration, which is still an aspiration, something which we're fighting for. And I'm thinking if, 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 if we think that way, we will begin to appreciate that the international, which perhaps we all want, it will be a product of the intensified planetary human entanglements, not a product of colonization of the world. So, so that's, 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 that's one issue which I, which I wanted to, to put forward. I want also to, to, to buttress that point by saying the reality of the increased <clears throat> movement of people across boundaries, across continents, I think it makes this thinking even more important. And the, the issues of particularities and the pluralities, I think they are issues which are at the moment we have not actually managed to resolve them in a, in a satisfactory way. Uh, we are still clinging tenaciously to the bounded notions of citizenship and belonging with this, <clears throat> the nation state still existing as a, as a container. And the, within that context, we'll find that the major problem is how do we live with the difference without provoking issues of anxiety, fear, and sometimes violence. And that is an aspiration, as far as I'm concerned, we are not yet there. Then secondly, I want also to raise another <clears throat> uh, point, which I think will be important as I, I drive towards this issue of uh, debating the issue of, uh, should we forget international studies? And this is the issue of, I've tried to think very carefully about the systems and the institutions and the structures in which we work with. And my thinking is that they seem to be lagging behind and they almost out of date vis-a-vis -vis the realities on the ground. Hence, people are deciding to either create walls around, around some states in order to prevent other people from coming in. And people are, are trying to live in the past uh, when, when, when the present is saying something else. And I think it's an important point that will need to take into account. <clears throat> and I want to move on also to, to say, uh, 
the shift from the empire to the modern nation state did not solve the problems. If anything, it actually increased more problems. With the shift from the empire to the nation state, we saw a lot of bordering, multiple bordering, in order to define ourselves as national and the others as people out of the place. So that is the challenge which we're facing today, which means therefore the issue of attainment of what is called national sovereignty did not solve the problems. It actually created even more problems. And secondly, that very issue, if we look at it closely, it hijacked the whole noble struggle of decolonization. The attainment of national sovereignty became actually the goal, but I don't think decolonization can be reducible to that attainment of, of national sovereignty. Bearing in mind with hindsight, we now know who are the beneficiaries of national sovereignty. The bourgeois male elites are the ones who are in charge of those, of, of those states. And that those nation states units are being used in service of capital more than anything. So, so I think it would be important also that perhaps we celebrated something which we're not supposed to celebrate. <clears throat> then I'm moving on, building up to, <clears throat> to, the, to the other point of uh, which I wanted to, to reflect on today, that one of the major challenges of today is how to name the, what we study correctly. And I think it is important to think really about naming what we're studying correctly. And I think to say something is international means nothing. We'll need really to name correctly that what appears as international today fundamentally is global coloniality. And I think that is the best way to name it, a drawing on the work so far of uh, Ramon Crossfogel. Of course, I know there are counter arguments like uh, you, you don't over, over, over emphasize colonialism uh, as the, as the uh, overarching uh, problem, but I think it is a major problem. It is a major problem in the sense that we're talking about colonialism not as an event, we're talking about colonialism as a power structure, a global power structure which survived the dismantlement of the physical empire. And if we speak about it that way, we will see the intentionality of coloniality, that the intentionality was actually to subject all aspects of human life to its own power. If it is human beings, you socially classify them, then you racially hierarchize, then you gender them so that you subject them differentially in the, for the purposes of power. If it is nature, you redefine it as, as a natural resource. So there was intentionality to really have an overwhelming control. But because all hegemonic systems are not always stable, all hegemonic systems are always resisted, contested, and therefore it did not succeed in doing that. But the intentionality was really to subject almost everything to, to its power. And I'm thinking here, not alone in thinking about thinking about the international as an aspiration rather than a reality. Uh, <clears throat> and they, I'm thinking here along with people like the Senegalese philosopher, uh, Sulman Bashir Dian, who argued that the universal does not exist at the moment. The universal is not behind us. It is ahead of us. And in the same manner, the international is not existing at the moment. It is not behind us. We can't say there's a return to the international. We are supposed to actually invest the energy in creating the international, which actually accommodate pluralities and the diversities. So that, 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 is, that is one of my, my points. And that point is also emphasized by Emmanuel Wallerstein when he speaks of a more universally universalism, the one which is truly collective and planetary universalism. And you can see also Franz Fanon speaking about that idea that the colonization of the world, and if you, if you use Achil Mbembe's work, you will find that he's talking about this intention to conquer the earth and make it owned by a particular people. And, and, and that is what we call colonialism at the moment. And if you go then to Franz Fanon, you'll find that he was saying this wave 
of colonizing did not produce an international in which me and you are actually part of. We, if we were anything, we were pulled into it, kicking and screaming into that, that particular type of international. And that is not the international which we want. And therefore, this is why you find Fanon calling us less abandoned, this idea of uh, presented by Europe, this, this, this poison gift given by Europe to humanity. And they, you will therefore then realize that in my thinking, I'm also thinking alongside with Nguku Wationgo, who then says this aspired for international, perhaps will use the word globalitics. And they were using the word globalitics because we wanted to name even the utopic registers, what we are envisioning. We are beginning to name it now, even if we've not achieved it. So that word globalitics is naming that which we aspire for, whereby the centers of power will be decentered. The hierarchies will have fallen. And the way in that type of international, they, mal they must be multi-log rather than mere dialogues or monologues. There must be interconnectedness, equ equality of, 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 of potentiality of the different parts. And the, the Latin American thinkers, they then speak about it as pluriversality or pluriversity, meaning this international way by there will be many worlds will fit into it and antagonistically. It is not a, that, that international where you are part of it because of conquest. You are part of it because of the arranged, the hierarchical, asymmetrical power relations. You are part of it because you are part of it. <clears throat> and they, I'm talking here about something which, which we've been fighting. The first wave of the decolonial thinkers, if you go back to people like W.E.P. Dubois, if you go back to people like Cizé, if you go back to people like Sierra James, if you go back to people like Fanon and the many others, they've been addressing this question and we haven't attained it. So it will take us back to Cabral's issue that perhaps maybe we jumped too quickly to celebrate. We claimed too quickly our victories when we were not yet victorious. And it will be important that we invest in another struggle to make sure that we attain that which, in which a particular particularities are not a problem. A universally in which it accommodate particularities as they will put it. And then, I saw that in most of the papers, there is all of us almost we address the question of the present conjecture, particularly the, the, the problem of, of uh, the, the challenge which is caused by COVID-19. And uh, my, 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 my only contributing in that, in that area is that maybe as, as, <clears throat> as Lata spoke about it, uh, the post-COVID world, my thinking is, is that uh, perhaps what will be important for us is then to think of ourselves if we survive this pandemic as survivors. And if we think as survivors, what forms of ideology and consciousness should actually guide us? And if we think as survivors, I think all the arrogance will have been gone. We are all survivors, we're nearly, we're nearly gone. And, and, and that must actually teach us something. It must teach us something that we must not invest too much in the politics of the will to power. We must try to invest in politics of the will to live. We must also disinvest in economies of profit and they begin to invest in perhaps economies of care. We have realized that the health system needs attention more than the armies and all these other things. We have all of the powerful armies, but we could be killed by a virus. And that must be a lesson which I think the international which we are envisioning must actually take that seriously. <clears throat> so that, that's, that's what I wanted to say about that. But I wanted also to say, as we move forward, therefore, I want to propose that uh, we think about an epistemic revolution. There is no way we can have another international which is different from this one without an epistemic revolution. And I'm predicating this argument on a very simple argument that I will propose that knowledge seem to be actually playing a major role in, a, in, a, in a creating the realities. As, as, as some will think those who are philosophical than me to say, epistemology frames ontology. 
And if indeed epistemology frames ontology, then it means we will need another knowledge in order for us to actually create another world. We can't use the knowledges which we have been using in the past 500 years to think, and who has plunged us into the present crisis? And we try to use the same knowledges to move us out of the crisis. That, 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 that it doesn't make sense at all. And I, and, and I think it would be important really that we invest in, in, in these new knowledges, which actually then transcend what I've termed here, the imperial episteme, a resilient imperial episteme, which is refusing to fall, which actually is very seductive at the same time, to the extent that we all operate within it because it invited us inside. And then we accumulated certificate diplomas and everything within it. And then we became intellectuals, professors within it. So the problem really is to interrogate ourselves, uh, our, our, our thinking, our consciousness out of this cognitive empire, if, if that way it is accepted. And I thought concrete, therefore, that will take us to also reflect on the imaginaries of the international. We need to move away, of course, from the, the colonial imaginary of the international, which actually created in, in James Blout's words, the colonizers model of the world. And they, I think we need not to be shy to actually say, we are living in a colonial model of the world. We've been trying to fight against it, but we are not yet successful. So again, going back to Gabriel, I think again, we need not to say, to, to claim easy victories. This, this, this colonial world is still with us today. The Marxist, of course, they came and they tried also to fight with it from a vantage point of critique of capitalism and they trying to lay out the, the, the proletarian revolution as part of trying to create a better international, the international of the proletariat. And again, as we know, I, I don't think to repeat the histories of the, the fall of the Soviet Union and the, <laughs> the other issues, which actually dampen the spirit over that. But I must say that Marxist, there is democratic Marxism of the 21st century, which is actually trying to, to shift from Venkatist and the Stalinist type of, uh, of, of, of Marxism, which failed with the Soviet Union. And that one is more flexible because it then accommodates other movements feminist movement, indigenous people's movement, pan-Africanist movements into it. And I think that we need to actually work with it as an ally. And I think as an ally, which actually works, it converges with the decolonization of the 21st century. And that decolonization of 21st century, which the difference between it is that it takes the multiplicity of the problem. Or red later you spoke about the intersectionality. As, 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 as a major issue. And I think in decolonizing, we'll need to take that seriously because the capitalism is a problem. Colonialism is a problem. Imperialism is a problem. Sexism is a problem. Patriarchy is a problem. You can't actually fight it. As Lotte will say, you can't have a single issue struggle. We need really to take the full package of the problems so that we move forward. Thank you, Sabella. Then I need to conclude by actually saying, uh, I think also we need not to despair and say there are no resources. There are a lot of ideas which have been produced by the people who are not actually put in the, into the academy, whom were not reading, but there are many of them who have given epistemic resources of thinking about the new, uh, the new world which were envisioned. And they, I will actually uh, focus on that uh, during the discussion. I think for now, let me stop here. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Sabello. Um, and now Dr. Sitambali Mbete, without further ado. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you for this invitation to be uh, on this a panel on this round table with such esteemed uh, colleagues. It's quite uh, intimidating, but really wonderful to be here with, with all of you um, and to really engage in this very important conversation. Uh, as uh, my colleagues uh, Lata and, and Sabila have said, uh, the, the question around forget international studies is, I think, particularly resonant uh, in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, which is this major international crisis 
um, and the kind of complex international problem that we've been told is going to define the 21st century. Yet the responses to COVID-19 have been distinctly national. Um, and at the moment, uh, we are seeing this being exemplified in the rollout of the COVID-19 vaccines, which is following the all too familiar patterns of international inclusion and exclusion. So I am sitting here joining you from Johannesburg in South Africa, uh, and I will probably only be vaccinated in November or December at the earliest. Uh, Hopefully, I'll get vaccinated in time to attend BISA in person in 2022. Um, and so the, this replication of what Savile has called a colonial world, model of the world, um, I think we're living it in a very visceral way um, in, 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 in the current pandemic. We've also seen that the vaccine procurement and access um, has, has highlighted who is included in international trade and who isn't. So we know that the pharmaceutical companies approached the uh, rich developed countries of the world um, to procure vaccines. Uh, then they approached some Latin American countries and then they approached a country and then Asian countries and then a country like South Africa on the African continent. But Niger, uh, even Botswana, or, um, or, or, or other countries on the continent weren't included in the discussions on the trade of these, on, on, um, on buying and on the buying and selling of these vaccines um, last year when the discussions were taking place. Similarly, the list of states, if you look at a map of, of the states that support India and South Africa's application for a COVID-19 TRIPS waiver at the WTO, really reveals who's inside and who's outside uh, the international. Uh, I think that the discussion around that WTO um, waiver is also really highlighting the limits of our international governance systems. And so as the part of the world, as the global north that is recognized as international goes back to normal, uh, as we've seen with the, uh, the G7 meeting that took place and, and all of these in-person engagements that are taking place, what we've seen is a regression, a kind of going back in the rhetoric around international uh, relations. So whereas in the late 2000, in the first decade of the 2000s, you had this at least rhetoric of expanding the view of the international from the G7, then G8, and then G7. And um, this recent G7 conference was a throwback to the Cold War, uh, pitching Western capitalist democracy against Eastern authoritarianism and only recognizing other parts of the world as pawns in this grand strategic contest. So Joe Biden's uh, proposal of a Western Belt and Road Initiative to counter China uh, with no recognition of the agency of the, of, of the people that are affected. And so there's this big question about, is it back to the future uh, of nationalism and geopolitical contestation? Or can we imagine a different kind of international? And how might we think about the relations between people in different parts of the world beyond the confines of the nation state? And I think uh, Latter's uh, um, example of, of BRAC is so powerful about how people across borders are, are, are engaging with each other, are mobilizing, are, are problem solving. Um, beyond the boundaries of the state or the confines of the state. Uh, we've had already excellent um, exposition of the international uh, and, and what it is and where it comes from. Um, I just want to, small contribution uh, taken from a, a book by uh, Vinit Packer and Peter Vale on South Africa, race and the making of international relations. And they speak of the writing of William Archer, um, who wrote in 1912 about the idea of the international being one of the end of uh, colonial expansion 
and seeing uh, the world as a contained whole. Um, and so, and I quote here, that the international was a space of thinking about the globe as a singular space, uh, which was uh, fundamentally conditioned about upon colonial expansion reaching its finality, uh, close quote. Um, and so this idea of the international is being about seeing the, 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 the globe as, as a whole and everybody in it as a single unit. But as Sabelo's demonstrated, uh, the logic and the technology of empire continues to shape the international. And this global coloniality still is the uh, what we live under. So how can we reframe the international to overturn um, this colonial um, hierarchy. And uh, I think, you know, the book that, that uh, Thacker and Vale uh, published, I which, which is a book of a, an origin story for IR as emerging out of the efforts of Milner's kindergarten in South Africa. So people like Lionel Curtis, Philip Carr, really cut their teeth uh, working to construct the Union of South Africa. And they argue that this is then the blueprint for the British Commonwealth and the League of Nations, and then obviously the United Nations. And the relevance of this idea for me is that um, I want to think about who do we include, not only who do we include and who do we exclude, but how do we reconstruct the international to expand the realm of present and future possibilities for studying and making international uh, relations or global relations. And so I want to then talk about an example that I think is a very interesting one of how of an alternative international and that's Pan-Africanism. We Pan-Africanism has been neglected in standard studies of the international, but I think that it provides a really useful view of the international. And I borrow here from a chapter that uh, Sabelo wrote a few years ago on Pan-Africanism and international relations and quoting uh, Lumumba Kasongo saying, and I quote, Pan-Africanism is above all an international phenomenon. And as such, it should deal with power and interest and their dynamics in the international arena, international political forums, and the international political economy. As Loxley Edmondson said, and I quote, Pan-Africanism, however articulated or conceptualized, whatever its functional scope or operational habitat, is by definition an international relations phenomenon. The essential aspect of Pan-Africanism, indeed its distinctive characteristic within the complex of Black racial expressions, is that it is necessarily transcending territorial political boundaries. And when, in its most expansive manifestation, Pan-Africanism embraces a range of transcontinental relations, international relations analysis necessarily bears profoundly on the elucidation of that phenomenon, close quote. Now the term Pan-Africanism was coined by Henry Sylvester Williams, who was a Trinidadian lawyer who lived in uh, the US, uh, the UK, and he lived in South Africa. He was the first black man admitted as a barrister uh, in South Africa in the Cape Colony. And uh, he's often recognized as one of the organizers, along with Thompson John Thompson of Sierra Leone, uh, of the first Pan-African conference held in London in July 1900. And he formed the African Association, um, with, uh, in, which was the organization that organized this conference. What's interesting to me, just in that story, is this um, is all of these different people of African descent. So uh, Sylvester Williams, Thompson, and um, there were Nigerian people, there were Americans who were all involved in the organizing of this, of this conference. But what's interesting to me is the role of a black South African woman named Alice Kinlock from Natal, who was married to a half Scottish, half Zulu man who worked as a mining engineer in the Kimberley diamond fields. And when Alice Kinlock moved to England in 1896 with her, with her husband, she began activism around the conditions of black laborers in Kimberley. And she met Williams in 1897 
and really influenced his Pan-African uh, thinking. And in fact, in 1899, in a letter to Harriet Colenso, uh, Williams acknowledges, and I quote, the association is the result of Mrs. Kinlock's work in England and the feeling that as British subjects, we ought to be heard in our own affairs, um, close quote. And the work that she did, uh, she wrote a great pamphlet, I love this title, Are South African Diamonds Worth Their Cost? Um, and the work that she did around these issues really served to mobilize the group of diaspora Africans who were living in London at the time um, and engaging with people from home, whether home was Nigeria or Sierra Leone or South Africa or Trinidad or, or Barbados or the United States. Um, and, you know, sparked this movement um, of Pan-Africanism. So that leads me to two points. First is that Pan-Africanism is therefore in many ways an ideology of the diaspora. Uh, you don't know you're African if you're living in Africa. Uh, you miss Africa when you live outside of it. Um, and, so, and so it's partly in, in, in something of a diaspora um, and people yearning for dignity and self-determination. But, but, the, but the second point that I, want to, that I want to make is that it does show us how you can have this cross-border, cross-boundary engagement long before Twitter and other social media um, that imagines a different way of us living together uh, globally. Uh, but as Sabelo has said, uh, the, the whole issue of Pan-Africanism then got corrupted with the ideas of national sovereignty and the, na and the nation state in the immediate period after decolonization. Um, but we see, we still see glimmers and really interesting manifestations of Pan-Africanism and that spirit. Um, for example, in 2020, St. Vincent and the Grenadines joined the United Nations Security Council and to the surprise of many, um, used its position in the council to amplify the positions of Africa and the Caribbean. So in January, 2020, it allied uh, its voice with the three uh, African members of the council, Niger, South Africa, and Tunisia at the time, and created this informal uh, A3 plus one, uh, which then ganged together in order to really pursue particular positions on African issues and to counter the P5 in some cases. Uh, the uh, permanent representative of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Inga Rhonda King, said, um, I think it's been effective. She, and I quote, it certainly raised the eyebrows of many because it was not immediately obvious why it should be until we made the links that St. Vincent and the Grenadines is predominantly African descendants and indigenous. Uh, so the interests of Africa were also, and the well-being of Africans in Africa uh, would also impact on the, in, on the well-being of African descendants um, uh, in all African descended people um, in the Caribbean. So as I close, what does this mean then for our future thinking on the international? I think that uh, my conclusion is that we can't afford to forget the international um, because certainly so many of the challenges that we are going to be facing um, and challenges that, um, uh, that are going to be uh, spoken about uh, you know, after after me by Swati are very much rooted. Uh, so many of the local and national crises that people face uh, face are rooted in the working of the international. Um, and so, if we acknowledge that, and we acknowledge that knowledge creates reality, and the importance of knowledge production, then I think we need to be asking what questions should scholars of the international be asking to create a different reality of international relations. This involves the archives we excavate, uh, the methodologies we use, and who we center uh, in our research. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stambouli. And now, Dr. Swati Prashar. 
Thank you, Ahiba and Jenna, for hosting this. Uh, that uh, after those three presentations, it's a hard act to follow. What do I say that hasn't already been said? Probably just say, I agree with everything. Let's <laughs> move on. Um, so, uh, and also Julia and Bisa colleagues for actually organizing this. You know, I, I like this style where we are talking to each other. We have mm -hmm. shared notes and, you know, we have, we are speaking to the themes that we've brought up. So I think I really like this because I think, uh, you know, there's a general complaint now that academics are not listening to ideas, to each other, to the world mm -hmm. outside, you know, we're still very much uh, in our little ivory tower. So I think we're trying to dismantle that here a little bit. Uh, my uh, colleagues here, uh, Lata, Sitambale and uh, Sabelo, have all talked about how the international is constituted, how colonial it looks as a power structure. I think Sabelo mentioned that and intentionality, absolutely critical to that. And, uh, and basically about who and what gets to decide it's outside and inside, right? There is an outside when you think about the international and the inside. Uh, what constitutes its politics and how might we, in some sense, rethink, reimagine its epistemology and ontology both. Uh, and of course, I share their thoughts and vision. However, I think when I looked at the question, what struck me was also the forgetting, right? Like we are talking about international, but who is forgetting? Where is this forgetting occurring? And how might we uh, address that a little bit. So international uh, then in the last few years, as we know, um, clearly being forgotten in many different ways. It's taking a, it's taken a beating or it's being reconstructed if, if we want to go with the active forgetting. I think it works, it makes sense. So uh, we, uh, you know, I allude to uh, the provocation, Sabelo's provocation that the international must not be taken as a given an existing phenomenon. Uh, of course, it's an aspiration. Lata talks about uh, need to pay attention to the limits of English language. Unfortunately, we are all uh, dealing with here and Sitambale talks about, of course, uh, the, you know, Pan-Africa, but, but how you started so wonderfully with what's happening with COVID. Uh, the, the first thing for me is, you know, how, uh, not just how during the pandemic, but even before that, when we go back to, you know, the election of Donald Trump or Brexit or the rise of right-wing parties in Europe, somehow became all the dominant conversation in most of the spaces, right? Um, mean, and, and every event in the global South was always in comparison to what was happening in the North, right? It was always in relation to what was happening, what has been happening in the global north. So I think, uh, you know, there was excessive lamentation of what Trump's election meant. You know, in other parts of the world, we've we've seen much worse and probably much more, uh, you know, um, intense uh, politics. Uh, so. Um, some of we we were drawing attention to the international out there which has seen all these developments for a long time but of course there was this inability and i think sitambali you mentioned so well looking at the covid responses uh, vaccines for example the other day i was reading isn't it true that the us sent uh, 80 vials of vaccines to trinidad and you know what are we talking about international here uh, i think there's a lot to to think through that right it also made me think about Fukuyama's end of history as, uh, you know, international relations turning its back on history, saying that, OK, we're redefining history. And then, of course, in the 90s, when the conflicts began to emerge, mapping them onto bodies and ethnicities and different specialities, we said, OK, we are redefining geography. Right. Then, of course, comes technology that we're redoing technology in a different way. And now perhaps it's it's politics that we are redefining in this uh, in this international in the way we are thinking about the international. So basically, every time Western powers go up or down, IR uh, takes it as an epoch making event. And this uh, this absolutely has to be stated. We thought we were done with it with the end of the Cold War, but it doesn't happen. Come 9-11, come COVID-19, you know, every time the defining moment, the reference point is always the West. And that's a problem. Um, you know, we sat through so many discussions, extended solidarities, condolences, but, you know, none of it was about the ch changes in Asia or Africa, you know, what, what has been happening in these parts of the world, complete, uh, you know, kind of absence of those discussions, right? 
so I, I would say I would uh, and of course, the rise of countries like India and China, and I'll come to that in a minute. But but this new form of international that is being written within IR as a discipline or even beyond is quite ill equipped to address the, the, the world as we find ourselves in uh, issues of language and the expertise industry that Lata has already spoken about. Unless there is some kind of uh, radical thinking, right? And all of you have talked about dismantling these existing structures, re thinking collaborative strategies, I don't think that we are going to make very much progress. And I also kind of always feel that we have these conversations, we are having them repeatedly at different forums, but I think we need to talk about strategies. And I mentioned that yesterday as well. So, uh, so international has taken a beating but then i come to the fields of inquiry to which my own work speaks right which is feminist international relations and also post-colonial decolonial and i have anxieties and discomforts situating my own work within these right so international that is being forgotten within critical fields of inquiry so our critical fields of inquiry not being critical enough and that is an attention that we have been giving but at the same time perhaps we need to do more uh, so uh, as i said we have offered uh, the critique of the international but but how does feminist ir for example i i would argue lo still looks at the nation state as as the reference point than people and communities in in the way we are producing our work in the way we do our field studies and the way knowledge is written about right so it's india a case study on india a case study on bangladesh case study on sudan you know the language that we are using Using. Uh, that is one big problem. And moreover, we are we are not uh, paying attention to the ways in which feminist work is being done in other parts of the world, not perhaps using the language of Western, uh, you know, f feminism, you know, in fact, they even call themselves reform projects, reform movements, or even women's movements. I mean, there is a there is a problem with the vocabulary that has become normalized. And it is in that context that I wanted to, uh, uh, you know, that Lata, you mentioned, my uh, critique of WPS, which I have been talking about, Women, Peace and Security Agenda. And also, I would argue, extend that to feminist foreign policy as well. You know, these are uh, terminologies that uh, agendas that have become so legitimized now that we have actually stopped asking questions about the international within this, right? It's taken for, a, it's taken, uh, for granted uh, that this is how the international works, where knowledge flows in a particular direction. Uh, and these agendas are then, you know, kind of imposed on to other parts of the world. I think it's problematic. Uh, our findings have to be commensurate with state funding body objectives, right? And uh, so many, uh, uh, you know, states are involved in funding these projects. And somehow we have lost that critical edge that we need to we need to seriously worry about the ways in which, uh, you know, criti critical uh, inquiry is being co-opted by states to propagate uh, their their kind of ideologies. So that's that's my kind of critique of, uh, and, and I can speak to it a bit later. Data. But then I want to extend that also to uh, to post-colonial decolonial space, right? And this is a conversation we perhaps need a whole day or many more days to talk about. Uh, so most critique of the Eurocentrism of IR also centers around a critique of mainstream IR, right? Delivered by, uh, you know, maybe critical scholars like ourselves sitting here, right? Uh, Maria Eriksson Baz and I have uh, co-authored a piece which is uh, not yet been published, but it soon will somewhere, we don't know where. The master's tools shall never dismantle the master's house. And basically we are arguing that uh, pretty much post-colonial, decolonial IR uh, is also doing the same thing as mainstream, that is taking the Anglo-Saxon, Anglo-American departure point as the point of, you know, as, as that is the point of departure. Uh, and reproducing Eurocentrism in two specific uh, two specific ways. One is that there is a risk of reproducing uh, Eurocentrism by overstating the power of the global north, right? In, in, and we do that a lot in post-colonial studies as well. And I, and I would uh, not uh, at this forum at least dare to generalize, but these are some of the observations I've had working in this field for a while now, that there is a kind of uh, quest to expose uh, and critique continuing neo-colonial relations and the focus on Western interventions and governance neglects international independent of the West. And this is something that uh, I have found that uh, is, is, is quite profound when we think about, uh, you know, how we need to be a little bit more reflective within the post-colonial space about how we uh, take uh, 
uh, this this point of departure as, as kind of the real point. Uh, and, and related to that is the idea that the, the risk of not attending to agency, right? How do we frame puzzles about the international? So parts of post and decolonial IR put subaltern invisible subjects at the center of their research, right? Mm -hmm. Much of the I, much of IR focuses on Western, uh, in particular, US foreign policy interventions in their various forms. We look at security, military, humanitarian development, all of those concepts, uh, demonstrating perhaps that how Western interventions, including those involving brute force, such as what we saw after 9-11, they, they are legitimized as civilizing missions to save victimized and primitive others. So in some sense, we continue to, uh, you know, um, uh, deny agency to some of these uh, you know uh, communities and uh, and geographies which are uh, there's a lot of churning going on there's a lot of important work going on that we have kind of sidestepped in our in our zeal to prove that you know there is a certain linearity uh, and uh, that agency is somewhere missing in in the work that we do uh, so uh, that then becomes my critique of how critical we are and should we think about criticality differently. But then going back to the question of forgetting, I also want to talk about uh, the forgetting that is occurring within domestic spaces, right? So in some sense, the domestic has trumped the international, right? Will, will the international be completely forgotten or resurrected in new understandings? And Sitembele, of course, you alluded to this. COVID-19 has shown us that the responses have been national. I mean, living and working in Sweden, I have uh, I had never before witnessed the barrage of uh, uh, Western nationalism, uh, mm -hmm. Swedish nationalism, as I have seen here. I mean, uh, last year when it all started, you know, you could um, not around the same time you could not question that uh, you know this is a problem how we are uh, uh, how Sweden is responding or how it treats its migrants. Uh, you know, I still haven't been vaccinated or uh, mm -hmm. so. So there are lots of problems in how states have become. Uh, you know living the colonial as uh, as, uh, as Sabelo said living the colonial and visceral ways but all of you located in those contexts you know what I'm talking about the nationalism is so on your face now and so and I'm thinking of even China and India right two countries that I have started uh, I follow of course I work on India but also China very interesting you know the Asian century the rise of China it's uh, and we talk about how it's fueled by relentless globalization uh, as if you know it's related to the global political economy but the enabling factors are actually the domestic politics of the Communist Party, right? The economic autonomy that they, they are, through which they have constructed, uh, you know, the relationship of the citizen and the state. So they, of course, they are uh, emphasizing on the domestic uh, in even even how they claim histories and how they how they act uh, on that. And I see a similar kind of development in India with, uh, you know, go with the government in power, with how the COVID responses have occurred. Uh, I mean, uh, nobody cares now in India, the discourse is not how the West perceives. The gone is the Nehruvian era where, you know, they would worry, the government and the state would worry about how the rest of the world perceives them. Now they don't. They're like, you know, this is a new discourse. Like it or reject it or critique it or, uh, you know, however much it upsets us. The fact is that this is happening. People don't care for how uh, Western or dominant powers look at the country, its politics, how they critique it. You know, there's a, there's a different kind of uh, engagement there. So then uh, return of politics to the people in a new international is what I want to uh, talk about as well. And there is a new international in, in uh, if you like, which is being constructed, which is perhaps emerging from domestic spaces. Uh, and uh, this is very well captured by Ashish Nandi, one of my favorite scholars and uh, someone who I greatly admire. He talks about, you know, uh, and I quote him, uh, however odd this might sound of readers of a collection on world history, millions of people still live outside history. They do have theories of the past. They do believe that the past is important and shapes the present and the future, but they also recognize, confront, and live with a different past from that constructed by historians and historical consciousness. They even have a different way of arriving at that past. So in some sense, what I want to say here is that there is a rebellion of the people who have been outside history, outside the international for too long, outside politics, right? They, they are 
they are now saying we have a stake in this politics and we are going to make our presence felt and it's happening through black lives matter through uh, dalit politics in india so there's a there's a there's this return of politics to the people is is going to shape the international in many ways right uh, so finally i don't want to sound all negative we need to hope uh, every now and then we need to inject a bit of hope uh, hope will come through of course radical thinking right it's important and but i also cautioned yesterday that who does the radical thinking the labor of radical thinking also we need to be careful mm -hmm. all of us sitting here in tenured professorial positions we can perhaps afford to do that but you know what are the risks involved for our younger uh, early career colleagues what we would want epistemologies and theories to do there are many knowledge systems in the world we need to access and learn from and and we are always so willing to teach and impart expertise to we are always willing to do that you know teach them expertise uh, teach them something how about just mm -hmm. absorbing it now and as the one of you said that the experts are out there you know treat them as experts uh, and so what we need is a methodology of turning our minds downside up as i call it an attempt which was uh, which is actually made by the editors of himal which is a popular south asia magazine to focus on people rather than on geography so they've reverted the map of uh, south asia so you look at the map uh, downside up not the way in which we are normally used to and i think we need to do that a little bit so finally um, you know because i'm the last speaker it would be unfair to not end this with a bit of poetry and so habib jalib from pakistan is one of my favorite poets and uh, you know he also led many re rebellions and talked about challenging powers at great risks as ac academics i think we would do well to understand this moment of rebellion this return of politics to the people this doing unmaking of the international and the and the yearning for a different politics we have to we have to repoliticize ourselves in a very different way right and jalib's words which i'm just going to quote for you are for us as academics uh, who as much as for those who hold political power right to undiscipline ourselves uh, to uh, and to resist where and when we can that's important the caution to simply reject and to be part of sabello's call for epistemic revolution and the words that i want to go leave you with is he says and this is a translation flowers are budding on branches that's what you say every cup overflows that's what you say wounds are healing themselves that's what you say these bare-faced lies this insult to the intelligence i refuse to acknowledge i refuse to accept thank you very much thank you so much all of you these are all very thoughtful and, and thought provoking interventions. Thank you so much. Um, we now just directly open um, um, to the audience to pose their questions and um, our panelists will be answering. And we already have two questions. One from Pasha, what indigenous and or ter territory based collective knowledge production have each of the panelists found that you could uplift as reference points? We have another question. Um, how can we tackle the issue of, inter of the international when um, the publishing industry is predominantly based in the Anglo-Saxon West? And so many um, um, universities in the global South can't afford the access um, um, fees to these journals. So, Shall we go in, in the same order, Latte? Uh, uh, so, so we start with Lata and then Sabello and then um, Sitembeli and then Swati, or shall we reverse? I think let's let's just for brevity let's let me just go because I'm go for still it. In reverse the adrenaline is still there so let's just go for it yeah so indigenous uh, there's a question about territory based collective knowledge you know I I don't have a specific answer to this but I do believe that the only future for academia is a collaborative future and the problem is that it is not just between uh, within the international space international academia there are problems I work on South Asia and I see how 
how much of the global south and north divide exists in the south and also exists in the north. There is a south in the north, there's a north in the south. And we don't talk about those uh, moments, uh, those uh, processes of coloniality where indigenous writing, for example, in India, there is no indigenous person doing that writing. And to my utter frustration, it is all non-indigenous people writing about indigenous people, mm -hmm. right? So why aren't we even talking about that? I mean, why does it make us so uncomfortable? So that's one uh, thing that I really feel. And collaborations to, to build them with humility and to realize that we have a job here to do, not pedal and uh, you know expertise industry as Lata, you were alluding to. And then uh, there was the question also about, um, you know, the, the publication, right? Yes, there is a problem with uh, prioritizing university presses, you know, everything coming. And, and I don't know if you guys have noticed all university presses work, the final part of the editing, whatever copy editing and all, it's all shipped to the global south. And there is this political economy of publishing that is so frustrating. Those people are paid nothing. They go to all the English speaking countries, uh, uh, Oxford University Press, Cambridge, whoever, you know, this is the process. So we have a lot, uh, 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 and of course they have opened markets, as you know, in different parts of the world now, Sage and uh, Routledge and Cambridge and Oxford, they all have their own market in different parts of the world. So that is a problem. Having said that, it is a democratic space. Publications has become really democratized. And as I said yesterday, for those of us who can afford to be gatekeepers, let's just go for it let's become those gatekeepers it's not a bad thing to have privilege and to do some gatekeeping to shut out those who are publishing uh, you know too much and to actually pull people and sabelo you will back me on this we did a brilliant job with our third world quarterly special issue right to which you were such a important mentor and contributor so we have to do this actively right so i'll shut up here over to you Sitam. thank you Sitam Bali. uh thank you uh i just yeah i mean I think Swati's taken so much of, of what I would have said. So in answer to that first question on indigenous and territory based not, um, knowledge production, and you know, for me being in the global south, being in South Africa, getting publishing, um, firstly, of black South Africans, um, but then secondly, in indigenous languages. Um, is immensely difficult. I mean, um, and to build collectives in that way and to do it not only in, um, so there's growing um, uh, collectives of writing in, 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 in fiction and kind of poetry and, but in terms of academic writing and writing academically around these, these issues, it's still um, very, very um, closed to uh, the people that we want to hear from. And so I think that there's a lot of work to be done within our context. So uh, I mean, in, in South Africa, particularly, or in the rest of the African continent, publish on the continent is hugely difficult and hugely expensive. And to distribute writing within the continent um, is immensely difficult. And so, um, and so yeah, so I, I, I just want to reinforce that from, from Swati. And then on the um, tackling the 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 international i think that those of you who are the gatekeepers with the right politics um need to make it easier for people from the global south to publish in those journals um and i think that there are barriers uh, of, of entry in terms of um you know getting the calls to you know the 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 calls for papers and and getting access to uh, to those journals and then just how expensive they are um, and many universities I'm in one of the most privileged universities in the country and on the continent and so we have access to 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 many of the of, of the major journals um, but even then there's serious limitations and so trying to work out how to share um, work beyond the confines of the paywall, I think is, is a very important thing. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Um, Sabello? I don't think I have much to add, except to say one of the, the issues is a reality that uh, the global economy of knowledge is still asymmetrical in structure. It's a reality that uh, 
uh, we still operate within those structures. But uh, one of the issues which we're trying to do, particularly from the chair which I, I hold, is that we also embark on a recovery of those knowledges which have been pushed to the margins, the thinkers who have been pushed to the margins. Uh, we even try to, there is a big project which is done by a partner organization in Nigeria, which is actually looking at the production of knowledge by women intellectuals, uh, because they also are not visible within the, the global economy of, of, of knowledge. So those are the initiatives which, which we are trying to, to use to, to try and uh, change this, this situation. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you. I mean, they're, they're both really great questions. I'll, I'll take them in, in reverse order. So on the publishing, yes, it's a problem. Um, and I think it's frustrating because I think there's a, there is a sort of more nuanced dynamic there, which is if, we, and in a way they're related, those questions. So there is also something about the West that I think we shouldn't underestimate is also aspirational. So part of the challenges, and, and I think it goes back really well to what so many of my colleagues on this panel who I'm like, I'm so inspired and my mind is pinging. I'm not quite sure what to do with that, all the things that you all have said, but I'm just, yeah. So thank you all so much. That was amazing. Uh, I've learned a lot and really enjoyed that. And But it does highlight for me that there is a dynamic here where in a way there will be people and places that will be aspiring to that westernness because that's the frame that we exist in so so then the question of you know do you do you publish in the west um well no we shouldn't be promoting that because that entrenches a sort of western hegemony on knowledge production but of course the way the system the way that people interact with the way the system is built and framed if you don't do that, then you risk being excluded completely. And actually, then if you're saying to people, no, no, I want to know about your indigenous knowledge. It's like, well, actually, no, I don't want to talk about that because I know that puts me at a disadvantage. So there's a bigger picture. And I think, Swati, your point about gatekeeper is really important. If we have power in that system, that is the sort of conversation that we need to be having in as many places that people will listen, because that's the sort of more structural um, element of what within higher education anyway, that we can at least try to um, uh, influence. But I would, I would say on the point of indigenous, I mean, it is, use, it is important to say that indigenous and the notion of indigeneity is a deeply politicized language on its own. It is, a, it is, a, it is an identity that sits in opposition to a colonial um, um, framing, right? So indigeneity wouldn't exist if you didn't have the colonial being centered, just like whiteness gets centered and invisibilized, colonialism gets centered and invisibilized. And then indigeneity exists in opposition. And it is an umbrella term that really collapses an incredible diversity around the world of people who might be categorized as indigenous, but actually may not have very much in common at all. So I think, I think that in a way, just going back to that question of language, and I think it again echoes what everybody has said. So, you know, um, Stemley, your point about Pan-Africanism as, as a reorienting lens to think about international. So we don't talk about it as Pan-Africanism, but a new way of, of doing the international. And Swati, your point about the EU and then, and then sorry, not the EU, um, Eurocentrism, and, and that as the central departure point of your analysis, which goes back to your um, a colonial episteme, uh, Sabello, all of those taken together would suggest that maybe indigeneity is not even the right language because it mm -hmm. yet again mm -hmm. centers mm -hmm. the colonial enterprise. It puts that as the, as the norm. So in a way, maybe the, the brainstorming has to be even more ambitious than that. I don't know what that word is or how we call it, but I think it's important to have that critique at the forefront of our mind in terms of what indigenous does represent and not be tied down by what that language implies. Um, there's other things that you can say about knowledge production. I mean, there's Buen Vivir and there's all sorts of things that come out of sort of global south movements around alternative ways of living. But it's important to think, I think, about the language as much as, you know, what the end point is. I think we've got a there's that systemic kind of discussion we have to have first. But thank you for your questions. I'll stop there. Thanks, Heba. Thank you. Um, 
we have three minutes to go. Any more questions? I think there is um, quickly, can I respond here? Himba? Yes, go ahead, please. Yeah, there is one uh, good point that Anya Liang, you make about uh, we could have more panels and round tables. However, action speaks. It's time to take action. What are some of the concrete steps? And I think that is really, really critical. And this is where yesterday's uh, discussion, I was still cautioning that it's all good to talk about Sabelo. And I think all of us in this panel can talk about revolution because we have made that journey. I cannot even imagine the academic precarities for our colleagues who are not yet in the job market, that if you were to lead a revolution and say you will not publish here, you will not do this, you will not play by the rules, uh, what will happen? Uh, at the same time, if it's, uh, you know, and, and we can, and this is what we need to do, perhaps the next step should be not uh, to discuss this again, but how do we then reshape, retool the international, what tools of, what, what Sabelo would want us to equip ourselves with to uh, be part of this revolution. But I think as we move towards that, uh, I, I think we'll also have to ask ourselves uh, how much of the game that we want to play. And I, I want to use this opportunity to say to, to you that, uh, you know, I have been always uh, coached and scolded by senior feminist uh, scholars or senior people that I never did um, I never was strategic. That's the word that was used uh, once to tell me that I wasn't good enough or that I needed to be more. You know, I don't want to be. So these are choices that we make. The, the less the stake in the academic uh, hierarchy, uh, the more the freedom to be able to say. And people have survived with the freedom. People, uh, everyone doesn't need to play the game. So if some of you really feel really like it's killing your soul, don't do it. Thank you. Thank you. Any more concrete steps? Other Otherwise, I'll ask the panelists to pose questions to each other. <laughs> Maybe just uh, the one last one. I think, again, the issue is and not to lose hope by saying nothing has been done. Mm. I, think, I think it is important that we take ourselves ourselves serious in the first instance and taking ourselves seriously means that we are not standing on the ground. Uh, I used in the paper standing on the shoulders of the giants. Those who have, who have gone before us, we have laid a very good foundation for very good concepts which are neglected and are not used. And uh, I think we need to pick from there that we are not really alone here in this struggle. We have very powerful if i can use our sisters who have who have who have who have actually almost given us the tools with which to to run with but those tools are normally hidden somewhere they are in the margins and i think it is a duty of us to distill them and they make them really usable for our current struggles <clears throat> thank you all so much this has been amazing, a very intellectually stimulating and um, just, it makes me happy, such a great panel. And uh, I hope this is the start of something. We'll take it from there and, and, and continue the conversation. I'll be in touch. Thank you so much. And I'll see you later in other panels. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so everyone. much for having bye -bye. us. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye. bye.